Welcome all to uh, Beyond Byte, uh, prototyping in Swift iPad Playgrounds. I'm Stephen Lipton. A um, little bit about me, I have several hats I wear, and some of you who've been to either getting donuts with me or went to my event, you've probably heard my story already. But I really have three jobs that I, I do. The uh, first one is working for Scientific Device Laboratory. We are a medical microbiology, medical device company making all kinds of various inventions for different hospital laboratories and stuff. And I'm an IT director there. Uh, besides that, I also work, I also have my own company called Make App Pie. And most of that is in publishing, and I've been busy publishing books on iOS development of various types of sundry things, a lot of it having to do with UI. And uh, so that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. But then Make App Pie brought up somebody else who got me very interested in something, and I've been very, very busy with those guys. Uh, Lynda.com about a year ago recruited me to be one of their authors. In the meantime, LinkedIn bought Lynda.com, renamed the company, well, it's actually now two companies, but there's also a rename called LinkedIn Learning. And I have since then been recruited even further than that, where I am one of a select number of people who are authors, mostly multiple vendors. I'm on course number eight, should be out sometime this fall. Um, multiple vendors to help market the new product line as LinkedIn Learning. And they gave us all kinds of special powers. So this course is going to be a very short one. I'm like 45 minutes to try to explain Swift Playgrounds, which could take, which I know takes three hours because that's how long my course is. Uh, one of the courses I did for Lida.com and LinkedIn Learning is running now at three hours. I've recorded five hours of material uh, in doing so. So what I decided to do, that's the wrong thing, but for this week, my course is free. It's outside the table. Uh, you'll find on Slack the correct link, which is actually bit.ly uh, Swift Playgrounds with a small s. So if you put the large s, you get somebody's Mashable column. Uh, but if it's a Swift Playgrounds with a small s, it's on the it's on the app, both on my channel and on I think the the attendees channel. Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, get. And you can spend all three hours learning all of that. So everything I don't cover there, everything I don't cover here, you'll find something in there about that. So I want to start with a little story, because I want to give us an example to play with as we go through this. And so let's assume we have a pizza restaurant, okay? Bunch of people who are or native Hawaiians say they are sick and tired of hearing this Canadian thing called Hawaiian pizza, which in case you didn't know, Hawaiian pizza is Canadian. It was invented in Chatham, Ontario, and its author just passed away two months ago. No. Um, after his long debate with the President Eisen, he wanted to ban pineapple for pizza. Um, but they want to have authentic Hawaiian pizza. And so they start a company they call Uli Pizza Company. And they're in the process of building this company. Part of the thing they have to do is make an online presence, make an app presence, and things like that. But in order to do that, they've got to get their oh, yeah. paper stuff. Uh, they have to get investors, stakeholders, and the like. Well, let me just shut off the Wi-Fi because it's going to be a pain. There. Um, they have to get them involved. So they're going to have to show them stuff. Okay. And that brings me to what the next point I want to make is. And that's a, a, a quote that I really love by Jim Collins. We, we, his book, Great by Choice, is Fire Bullets and Cannonballs. And what does he mean by that? He was talking about pirate ships. One of the things that many pirate ships would do is they'd fire musket shots until they hit something. And when they heard that they hit something, 
Then they fire the cannibals. A musket shot is cheap. It's fast. You can do a lot of them without a lot of expense. A cannonball is expensive. It takes a while to do. But it's got the power that you're going to get to hit. And that's what they're getting at is because this is prototyping and production. Bullets are our prototypes. We want to do them fast, we want to do them cheap, and we do as many as we can to get it right. There are lots of ways of doing it. A lot of us will go through beta and go through iTunes Connect to make a big beta, and then we have to, when we present to somebody and say, okay, here's this, download it here, or any one of the different ways we can do it. I just got one uh, about the beta for the new Swift Playgrounds just today. They're doing the next upgrade. That takes a lot of effort, at least in terms of getting all the pieces together. Wouldn't it be much easier just to have something together, you have to register with Apple and airdrop it to somebody? And that's one of the things that Playgrounds lets you do. Now, I've got a couple of files here, which you'll find in the Downloads folder uh, that I have set up for you, that I'll be using throughout this presentation, so if you want to play along, you can do that, or check out later. But that's what I want to talk about with iPad Playgrounds in particular. It makes for a great way to have easily distributable. And right now, AirDrop and Zip are the two easiest ways to do it. When the new version comes out, with iOS 11, we'll have shared files. Uh, which is the, the big new thing that's going to make this version the, the, as good as it is, is that there will be a shared fi file version, which I didn't want to show today because it, it's in beta and it definitely shows its betaness. Um, now, there are a lot of frameworks that you can use with Swift Playgrounds, both on Xcode and on your iPad. So you've got a lot of stuff you can play with. Some of the things that still aren't there tend to be things that require permissions. They're saying they're going to have the, the camera is going to be new in the newer, newer versions. Uh, but I haven't seen notifications yet, so you can't play with notifications. So there, it, there's still some yeah, still some things that are out there. Now, for those of you who have never touched Swift Playgrounds on an iPad before, I wanted to go a little bit into what it's really supposed to do. And that's as an education thing. It's meant to make the like, kids and people who don't know code learn Swift. And even everybody in this room, if you want something fun to do on your way home, try the Swift Learn to Code. They are interesting little puzzles, and I'm going to pull one up from the Hour of Code, which is the shorter version. There's actually three full versions, but this is a short hour one. And it's got lots of cute little things, but I'm going to come up right here with Loop Jumper. Okay. And what you get is on one side, which is your code page, you get a challenge. On the opposite page, which is loading now, where it's run my code, you get this guy, okay? which is where my title comes from. And I can actually expand that out a little bit so you can see it. And you get a little environment. And it's a puzzle game. This is a puzzle where you collect the gems. And every time you learn to collect a new gem, you're learning new code features. So it starts with the simplest thing of calling the function, and you then go into how to iterate. This is an iteration one on how to use a for loop and so on and so forth. And you get to use those code as you're learning, you're using those codes to make this work. This guy's name is Byte, which is where my title comes from, is getting beyond him. But we can go very quickly. You can see, as I move around here, move around the environment. This particular challenge is that we're going to, uh, oh, he's already getting bored up. Um, we're going to collect the gems, and it's just a simple pattern that you have, to repetit, you have to repeat five times. And so the pattern is you're going to move forward, you're going to turn left, then you're going to move forward to collect the gem, and then move right to reset yourself. 
And to do that, which is the reason I'm really showing you this, is to get rid of the whole idea that you absolutely need a keyboard. I'm going to tap where it says to enter code, and you'll see on the bottom it's got auto completion suggestions. So you can go ahead and just say move forward, move forward. Actually, I don't want to do that. Back that up. Move him over here. Because that will run him off the page. I want to turn left. Turn left. Move forward, move forward. Collect gem. Turn right. And I can run that code and see what I get. There we go. And he's upset because he only got one of them. Okay. A little one more time just for fun. <laughs> okay. So we're not done yet. We need to add the for loop. I get a four, it comes up with asking me the number. Okay. I can then click the for loop, and if it's behaving itself today, drag it up to the top, drag my base down, and put the code in. And now when I run it, I get all the gems. And if I'm in a rush, I can run fastest and speed them up. Tells me it's great. He gives me a little happy dance. Everything's okay. So that's what it's meant to do, is to do this, is to do this kind of education. And Apple has come out with four of these and a whole bunch of other templates that you can use to explore and, and discover. What I want to do is go one step further. Now, again, first thing I want to talk about is this side over here. It's a live view. And that's what it's called, it's a live view. And one of the things you're going to have to do with a prototype is you're going to have a view controller or a view that you're going to display and want someone to interact with. So it's important to know how to get that view up there. Okay? This one happens to be a scene kit. So let's just get a playground. And you can see all the playgrounds. I'm going to go starting points, and I'm just going to get a blank one. Call it the blank playground. In the blank, blank playground, I'm going to hit this up button so I can get a keyboard. And I'm just put I am for import and ask me for a module. I'll put UI, suggest UI kit. There I go. I am import, and here's the important one the one you may not know about is playground support. So, with those two, you can do anything you want to do on UI kit on a live view. There's a little plus at the upper right, which lets you get to a whole bunch of different commands that you may want to put in your program. I'm going to hit the class one and make a view controller. And then we'll do a view did load. Do that. I have no idea what that did. Okay, come on, where'd you go? Oh, that's why. The helps if you put. Now, in this, which is one of the new things you'll start seeing in some of the keyboards, by the way, if you drag down on some of these keys, 
You don't have to shift anything. You can get a, co a colon, and then I can put in UI view controller, which would help. Now I can do this. And I'm just going to change the background color. View dot background color. And I can use the equals on the completion, or I can go to uh, D, drag down on D, and it pops up an equal sign. That one you have to be careful about because it doesn't put the space in. And I have two ways of doing colors. I could actually type in UI color whatever. I could use a enum. But one of the things that Swift Playgrounds on iPad does is it's big on literals. So there's a little square right on the left-hand side here where I hit. And that says, OK, what color do you want? I'll just pick a color. And just because I'm supposed to do it, let's put super, load, and now I have a view controller. Now with that view controller, I can assign it. Like so. And notice what it does when you put a parentheses, it gives you all your initializers. So it's already going to auto-suggest all of those for you, depending on what you're doing. And then all you're going to do is playground page, current, live view, oops, equals VC. I run that, and I get a background and a view controller that's a color. Okay. Now, in the downloads file that I gave you, which has that whole presentation, let me go back there, I gave a few other types of situations for that. So here's a view controller that's a little more robust. This one I put a background in. I'm going to take a minute to look at the background. But <clears throat> And since we're pizza themed, I threw a pizza in here. Of course, I had to do this right before lunch, but, uh, but with just a very short amount of code here, I, I included a pizza. Uh, you'll notice here, I actually named it. I actually used a name, I didn't actually use a literal. One thing when you're doing prototypes, you're going to be moving things around, and the literals don't move very well. So one of the things I tend to do, although you can use literal, I'll point it out here, you can use literals if you go to that plus sign and hit the second thing, the second uh, selection there, you'll get a set of source resources that are in this particular application. You can add to them by inserting from the photo library, taking your own photo, or from another file source. So if you had something, for example, on Dropbox that you wanted to take out, you can do that there too. And all that will be put into a folder I'm going to show you in a second. Um, you can do the same thing with views. And it's any kind of view. So we can do a UI view. We can go to Sprite Kit and start with an SK view. Uh, I'll just go for this one may or may not work. We'll see because of our Wi-Fi situation. But let me just pull up MapKit. And I did it in MapKit. And there I go, I have a nice picture of Coco Head. And I can switch it around here and get, and get uh, Honolulu. If it loads, there it goes. And all that's possible. So you can do any of those kinds of things very quickly. I mean, it's not a lot of code. I mean, this is, I mean, that's it to get a picture. It's not a lot. And that means you can work fast. Which is the point, okay? So, let's look at a prototype that I made up for the example, okay? Which is the Huli Pizza demo. And so, this is a 
Here's the code. This is a code that has two, con this actually has two view controllers. I have a view controller, I'm going to run it. You can see it. I have a view controller, and then I have a container view that I have a table view controller inside of. It comes up. There it goes. And what it does is it just tells you how much your pizza is. But that might be enough to say, okay, here's what our menu is going to look like, which may be enough to get them their thousands of dollars to open their restaurant. So I just have a banner. I have, which is the image view on the top. I have a label. And I have that container view with the table view controller. And that did not take me long to put together. I'm going to stop that and go back in the code. Now you'll notice something about this code that I want to point out. I pre-prepped this code for a reason. And you'll notice, if you look at the class, it's public. There's a reason for that. There's a great thing and there's a bad thing about Swift iPad Playgrounds. Swift iPad Playgrounds, when you're running on the code view that we have here, has great debugging. It's meant for kids, so you can do things like, oh, I'll just pick up that one there. You can debug and look at any point in your code, it shows you exactly what's there. So if I'm looking at a view, it'll show me that view at that point. If I'm looking at, um, something, that one, something that runs a couple times. If I'm looking at something that's run multiple times, it'll give me my values. I can see it as a graph. I can put it in the code so as I'm running it, I can look at it every single time. I can tap on this, change it to a list, look at my final values. I can do any one of those things so I have some really cool debugging tools. But that's the overhead. <laughs> this whole thing runs really slow in terms of, you know, as you can see from what I did, runs relatively slow because it's going through a lot of steps. It's really interpreted, not compiled. And that may be a problem when you're trying to show someone and you're waiting for it to load. So one of the things you can do with this is take your source code and put it in a new file, in a new folder in your playgrounds called sources. Sources then compile those classes to fast code, although if it's in compiling, it will give you classic compiler errors, not very instructive compiler errors. Many times it won't even do that, just say there's something wrong with your code, and not even tell you. So you want to make sure before you put it into sources, you got it cleaned up. Okay, so that's that part. What I did with the public bit here is those sources need to be public. And when you make a source public, you got to make several other things public. Anything that you're going to access in there needs to be public. So methods that you're going to be using need to be public. Properties you need to be used are going to be public. And the important one that most people forget, anything overridden needs to be public. So, and, and this is the one that I always miss, is view did load. And it will yell at you, if it doesn't. But uh, that one, it actually does have a good habit of yelling at you. No, you're not supposed to do that. But that's one thing I want to point out in the code. The other thing you want to do when you're preparing this is any playgrounds. If you're doing it on Xcode or on iPad, there's no such thing as interface building in any one of its many forms, be it zips or story books. It doesn't exist. You have to do it in code. What makes it worse is that page is changing size on you, dynamically, as you do things. Uh, the different size iPads are different sizes. It's meant for a landscape iPad. So the live view is always a landscape, but it's landscape in whatever device you have which used to be easy because it was 1024 by 768. 
permitting an error. With the pros, you've got two new sizes. So it may be somewhere where you're going to throw in an auto layout in code. Now, other people are going to talk about auto layout in code, other people are going to talk about a bunch of other things. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. Because you can go to other course sessions, which I'm going to go to myself. Um, but that's just how I do it, is I just write, write out all my constraints and have each piece set up with all my constraints there so that it always sets it up self up right. Otherwise, you get some weird results. All right, with that said, I'm going to go back here. Where are you going with this? This playground bus. You have a bunch of a prototype now, like I just showed you. What you're going to do with that, which I'm not going to have the best amount of time to show you the whole story of it, but I'll give you the, the details here, is you're going to use Xcode or a Mac. And I tend to just use sort of both because I'm going to use it from the binder with Xcode doing my editing for me piece by piece. It, it works better. I don't know, it's why I'm in it. Um, I'll author my playground book on the Mac. I'll send it to my iPad as a completed file. Okay. And the reason I'm going to do that is this. A playground book is a whole bunch of folders and subdirectories all over the place. It starts with a huge one for the contents. It has underneath that chapters, just like a book would. And underneath the chapters, there are pages. There's two kinds of pages you can use. We have our playground pages, and we have a cutscene. Cutscenes are HTML. And anything you can do on a web page, you can do in a cutscene. Apple uses a product called Hype for the Learn to Code ones which some of my slides are actually in height. But many of my slides like this one, I was able to do the presentation parts of my thing by just exporting from HTML and Keynote. So you can do any one of those kinds of things with the cutscenes. So you have the ability to throw other stuff besides your code in here. Again, the public sources. As you're doing this, you're going to throw a lot of your stuff. You want to try to have as little on your code page as possible. And so you're going to want to put it into sources, and everything needs to be public. And so, again, that's the public class, your variables, your properties, and your, and your methods, and the overrides. The other thing is you're going to have to compile this into a book, and this structure is a pain in the neck to set up because there are little things called manifests, I'm going to show you in a second, that are all over the place. So it's best to start with a starter. And Apple does have a starter, and if you go to the support page for Playgrounds, you can find the Apple starter. It's sparse, it doesn't have a lot of good examples of what you're supposed to do. Uh, I've had a lot of problems trying to run work with it because it's, it doesn't have enough stuff in it. You'll find on the downloads page that I, I gave as the, uh, the page for the downloads, which is on my website, you'll find an app high starter and a prototype starter. And the difference between those two is this. This is what the, uh, the app high starter is and what most starters are. They have more than one chapter. They'll have pages. They'll have cutscenes. Well, Apple doesn't have any cutscenes, which is one of its problems. Um, and they'll have the manifests. Now, manifests are XML documents, they're actually key lists. Uh, they're key lists that list what is in the next part. So the contents list what chapter it is and other properties. So it'll be the title, it'll be, and I'll show you some of those other ones, it'll be the photo that you're going to put as a, on your finder page, on your My Playgrounds page. Chapters will have the pages in them, and will have information. Will have the chapter name, so that when you do the table of contents, like I did here, those will show up properly. 
Um, and you'll see things like playground books and prototypes here. Okay. And then this will be labeled as playground books. For a prototype, we're only going to go one line. We're only going to have one chapter. We're only going to have one thing. So I compressed it so you don't have to get rid of everything else. So it's easy to just sort of more plop things into place as you can do it. And you don't have to make more chapters. One of the problems, with, and this is where I said well, there might be a problem sometimes with Xcode doing this, and why I like doing it on the Mac, is the Xcode has a hard time making and changing folders compared to Finder. If I'm in Finder, it's very easy to do it, and I'll show you that in just a second. And I find that I get myself, I keep myself more organized if I'm using Finder. Here's one more piece of the puzzle, which is a file called liveview.swift. Besides your contents, which will be, you'll have contents.swift, which is your code that, that you're going to run. But you're going to have another one called liveview.swift. You can sort of think of this as your view did load of your book. It's the thing that runs first. Very often it's meant to initiate the, pl the playground and the live view before you're doing anything else. There's a whole way of dealing with this where you can do interactions, which is what they did with the, uh, with the lessons, so that they start up the scene kit scene, but you're going to interact with it. That is far beyond what we can talk about today, and that's one of the few things that Apple has actually made some really good documentation on. So I'll just say you can build their documentation on it. I'll talk a little bit about the manifests themselves. Some of the good places to watch when you're looking at these manifests. Number one is the chapters for a chop contents manifest. You put the name in, and you can see there are different items. This, they go from item zero to whatever. Those are the order your contents will be. Be very careful, this is extremely literal. And anyone who's made a misspelling and wondered why their playground doesn't work, this is why. These are extremely literal. So watch how you're spelling things, because I, I, this is one of my big frustrations when I've been playing with these, has been I've made one capital instead of a lowercase, and it messes everything up. Above that, you've got some uh, version and content IDs type stuff. And then you've got icon appearance. And so your icon shows up. This will be the title underneath the icon in the, in the My Playgrounds. And it also has something called an image reference. So you can put in your resources on uh, the top level of this an image, and that image will show up like it did to learn the code, and you saw the, the, the ocean with the pizza on some of mine. It'll show that image. So it looks a lot more professional than just having a little bit of code sitting out here or a little Swift on there. Chapter manifest is very simple. It's pretty much the name of the chapter and the pages in the chapter. So I don't need to really go into that one too much. Page manifests have a few more things that you're going to have to watch. Version and name, same kind of deal as what we talked about. Now there's no more pages, but there's a bunch of properties that you should watch for in here. Okay? Number one is the live view mode. Do you want it visible or don't? Sometimes you're going to want to have text across the whole thing. You may want to show code across the whole thing. If you put hidden by default here, you don't have that live view sitting out there. You have all the page for text. Okay. Live view edge to edge, you'll notice that sometimes we have border, sometimes you don't. So the blue square I had before had a border. The actual demo didn't. Depending on how you want to present it, you can change that so that it will expand and contract out. We're using that as yes and no. Uh, playground logging mode is whether you're going to have that debugger on. And you can shut it off for things to speed up the process. And finally, the poster reference is before you hit run my code, what do you want to show on the live view? You can actually put an image on there. Okay. Okay. So
All right, with all that, I'm going to 10 minutes. Let me close this up. I'm going to minimize that for the moment. Okay, and I now have on here my playgrounds. So I've got a lot of different playgrounds going on here. Let's go look at the Hooli prototype playground first. And when we do that, we're going to go to show package contents. Yeah, let's do this so you can see what we got here. And we've got several different files and folders. And let me get a little bigger so you can see it up as far as it goes. So the contents that Swift in a regular playground, that's your code. Uh, this one has got some workspace and some other files. And I'll explain those in a, in a minute. Because I want to talk about resources and sources. That's where your code can be. And so resources has all my images. Sources, which don't have any here, would be those source codes that I would put in and I put a whole class or whatever in. Now, once I had this open, I'd probably open up another one, and I'd open up my starter, or copy my starter. And I'm just going to slip it over to my deck. It's right over here for now. And if I open it in Xcode, first thing you'll notice is it just gives you a book. So you have to hit Command-1 so you can actually get a navigator to begin with. And for an app high starter, you can see I put contents and different kinds of things like that right here. And you would just have to drop them in. But let's open up a playground chapter. And that's got a manifest with the pages in it. And in the pages, you have your different scenes. Okay. So I can go into the, let's go to the number two playground page here. I can double click on that, or click on that, and I can get my code. So there's my code, I can write my code, put it together. If I wanted to, I could put it in a sources. Let's go to, this one. Okay, so this is another demo that I created. It's actually a demo that it's going to be in the course. And you'll see, for example, in this one, I've got sources. And I've actually got a source already figured out. That is my whole view controller already planned out. And all those pieces are now in place. Okay. Let me go up to the content. Uh, let's go to this one here. Contents. You can see all the different pieces in place. Okay. So you can go back here. Be ready to run your thing. You've gone through this process. You've dragged and dropped everything in. You've renamed in the contents the chapters and the pages, the names of your files for all these different chapters and things. You put all those different things into the manifests. And when you do that, you now have a copy. Generally, I'm going to copy that into the Playgrounds folder in iCloud. And that will load it onto your iPad from your desktop. Because then it will save it over. And you'll get little red arrows when there's this. Let me just give you an example. Just 
just to throw a comment in there. And what will happen, once it saves the comment, is you'll get a little red arrow here saying it's updated. Some of them will say, oh, this is a new file. I've never seen this before. And you get the little cloud with a donut for the donut copy, for example. And you go ahead and click that, you'll see it download. And now you're in code. And then you can go ahead and run it. So, for example, I can run the Beyond My Bike one. One thing you may want to do is here I'm starting at the middle point. You may want to reset. Thing about books that I want to end on, or two things I want to end on books. Number one, again, airdrop and zip files are the best right now. With iOS 11 and version 2 of Swift Playgrounds for iPad, we'll have sharing of files in iCloud. But when you do that, before you do, and you may, before you do is a very important step you may want to try to remember. And that's, if you messed with the file, played with it a little, it doesn't change your code. It saves it in a separate log file. And so as I'm changing code in here, it's not saving it on that page like it does in a playground. Instead, it saves it in this log file and then it makes those modifications as it goes. And because of that, before you send it out to anybody, hit edit, click the file, and hit the reset button next to the garbage can. It'll ask you to reset document, and that clears any of that junk out. And then when you're ready for that, you can, for example, select a document, and I'll just do this one. Oh, a little off. Okay, let's move it over. Let me show you again. So, edit. Check what you're going to do. Hit the reset button. It asks you to reset. That clears out all that junk. And then you can go ahead and share it however you want to share it. So I can hit share or click this. Share. However you want to do it. And then it's back to however you do it. And so if you can do all those different things, again, you, you can use all the different ways. It says you can use other ones. I have never gotten to Google, Google Drive to work. Google Drive is a real problem with lists. If it was ever tried to save it again, Google Drive, if it, it starts thinking it's an XML file, it's just it names an XML. Um, so I don't trust Google Drive with this. I have not gotten it to work with Dropbox yet. But that would be how ways of sharing it. But generally what I'll do is I'll make it a zip file, and I can share any one of those in a zip file, and then that person has to put it on the desktop and change it, or I'll just airdrop it. But it's a lot simpler than having to set up a bay or a test track. So that is what I wanted to talk about. And you can get a hold of me. I'll be here around to talk if we need anything. I think we are just about out of time. But I think one question. Right. Um, say you were hosting this, like maybe you put together a playground for a presentation, a playground for a community plan, and you want to download it directly onto your iPad instead of zipping it. It's not quite no, a good idea. So, what's the best option there? At the moment, it's quite until September. It's the one caveat to this. Is it's like a big showstopper. It's a big showstopper. Um, and I'll be the first one to admit uh, Right now, AirDrop's about the best you got. Uh, I have played with it, and it's working okay. Uh, it does a very good job. It's actually sort of like forking it. I, I'd be nice if they actually went as far as going to GitHub and maybe share with GitHub. But uh, it, it looks like this will say, do you want a copy of this or do you want the original? And it, it'll actually do those kinds of things. I don't have it here, it's on my other iPad. That, because it's, it's Swift 4, some of my code doesn't work and I'd have to rewrite the whole code for the. Do you know if they have any plans to point it like, your playground at a feed that's on the video somewhere? So you can just update some of the software that you need to do? Not that I know. I wish. That's a, that's a, 
and that's that's on the wish list. I mean, this is the basics. What I'm really getting at is you can use the books to do these to do these prototyping. It's still better than some of the other options. Uh, yes, it'd be great if I could just push a button and show it up, which is really where they're going with this. And I was very excited when they said when they stepped up that they were going to be doing this. That's the new important function uh, of uh, Playgrounds 2 is to get that sharing function in place. Supposedly, it's going to be like a subscription service. I haven't figured out how they're going to do that yet. I've got it to share. I haven't figured out how they're going to do like a subscription service that as you do it, it'll push it. But supposedly, they're going to be able to do that. 